here we go we are there so today is the third webinar of uh, the third click webinar and we will go over the updates and the latest uh, uh, status of the click different modules uh, so we will go over exposure and toxicity the predictive life cycle impact assessment uncertainty and application of click uh, so my name is Ding Sheng Li and uh, we I am joined by Ren Sheng Song, Yu Wei Qin, Jessica Perkins, uh, Stefano Karachi and uh, <coughs> uh, Nicole and Nico Parker. <laughs> so this is uh, just a reminder. This is a uh, uh, one of the series of the Click Webinar series, and uh, we already have our first two, and this is the third and last one. Uh, you can find our all of our webinars recordings uh, on the Click website, which is click.ucsb.edu. And just again, uh, some of you may have already seen this, but this is just a very general overview of the Click project. So we are founded by the US EPA to develop a tool that can rapidly estimate the environmental impacts of chemical life cycle based uh, on chemical life cycle based on limited information. So we would. Uh, utilize some external data, also build up our default database library, and also combine with the uh, user's input. And then all these information and input will be processed by our various two modules, uh, like uh, the production, the use and end of life, etc., and give you outputs in different environmental impact categories. So first, uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the exposure module. Uh, so why do we need exposure models? Uh, I think some of you may have already attended the first two webinars, so you know that we also have a feed and transfer model to estimate the uh, concentrations in the environment. Uh, but this is uh, something like uh, the San Francisco Bay 100 years ago. You have concentration on the one side, but to get to the other side of human health impact assessment, you will also need exposure model to uh, connect the uh, environmental concentrations with human health. So currently, there are a few different categories of exposure models. Uh, the first one will be a very much utilized uh, far field exposure models. Uh, this is uh, these models are traditionally employed in life cycle impact assessment, uh, LCIA for short, and it usually considers inhalation and ingestions. A second type will be the near field exposure models. Uh, they focus on indoor exposure, personal care products. Uh, and uh, re in, in recent years, uh, this, this field has been fairly active because uh, tr traditionally the, RC, the RCA area hasn't incorporated near field exposure that much, but how, uh, even though it is very important. So we have seen a lot of activities in, in the near field exposure models. And for these models, they mainly consider inhalation and dermal absorption. And the final one is uh, still quite rare in life cycle impact assessment area, would be the internal organ specific exposure models. Uh, these will use, uh, these will make use of the physiologically based toxical kinetic model and the concentration of, and they will predict the concentration of chemicals in various organs after exposure. Uh, this is, as the name indicates, this is mostly used in quite detailed toxico uh, to toxicology study or pharmaceutical research. Uh, but recently, uh, there are some connection. There are some researchers making the connection between the uh, near field exposure model and sometimes even far field with the detailed internal organ specific ones. And as for the click models themselves, uh, we will uh, we will need some input for these exposure models, but also in, uh, and in turn it will give some outputs for uh, from the exposure models. Uh, so the input will be the concentration of chemicals in different media, and also various uh, parameters of physical chemical properties. And this will be mainly supplied by the phase and transfer model. However, if the user have more detailed information about the environmental concentrations, we will certainly use that. And the user will be given an option to input these uh, customized uh, concentrations. And for the output of the models, uh, we, uh, the user can have a range of that depending on their need. So we can give the total amount intake based on kilogram intake per kilogram body weight. Uh, we can also ca ca uh, categorize it as daily amount intake, uh, basically the previous metric divided by day. And then we also can calculate the intake fraction, which is a very popular metric in the LCA world, which is the, in, uh, the kilogram intake over kilogram emitted. 
and then we're ready to assess health risk uh, combined with the toxicity. But before the toxicity, uh, I, would, uh, I would dive in a little bit more detail on the exposure models themselves. So the far field exposure models, which are considering the outdoor environment con concentration and human behavior that results in exposure, they are mainly applied to byproducts during manufacture, uh, the pollutants uh, after, uh, from, uh, from, from, from emission, and sometimes also pesticides when they are applied over, over a field. And they are most suitable when there is no need to address the indoor exposure or thermal exposure. Uh, for example, if you are considering just the pollutants from the uh, stacks of factories, it is unlikely for someone to really like stand and hug the stock and get in hell all the bad stuff. So in this case, the, uh, the far field exposure model is sufficient and it is uh, suitable to use. And for the click tool, uh, this part is the far field exposure model is directly linked with a click fade and transform module. And then we have the near field exposure models. And these are most suitable for, uh, uh, for like example, examples of VOCs that are released from product used indoors. And of course, occupational setting when you are more concerned about the workers' health when they are doing their job. And uh, also products directly apply to skin, such as shampoo, lipsticks, lotions, etc. So as the name tells, these are all applications of near field. And uh, this is linked with the click release module uh, in which we have estimations of the release indoor. And uh, then from that result, we can link it with the near field ones and get the exposure uh, estimated. And this is just an example of comparing the far field and the near field exposure models. Uh, this is a result of one of our previous case studies, and but for confidentiality, uh, I am uh, I'm not showing the name of the chemical and other information. But basically, what this graph here is a sample output of the exposure model of the CLIP2. So on the x-axis, you can see that there, there are different exposure routes, like inhalation to outdoor air, ingestion from water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And on the y-axis, is the intake fraction expressed in kilogram intake per kilogram emitted. And as we can see, uh, and also the y-axis is uh, showing in log scale. So, so one, one tick over there is uh, basically 10 times. So we can see for this chemical, uh, the intake fraction is more or less on the same level for the inhalation to outdoor air, ingestion to water, slightly lower uh, for most of the uh, ingestions pathway and, and extremely low for the ingestions of meat and dairy product. And this might be due to the fact they have a poor bioconcentration factor in these uh, animal products. But if, you, uh, but if you look at the uh, inhalation with the indoor air, it is significantly higher than all the other exposure uh, because this product is actually used, has some indoor use and we are considering that. Um, uh, Yang, can you mute yourself, please? Sorry, I just did. All right, thank you. And then uh, this is more like ongoing research. Uh, the CLIP2 has not incorporated this yet. It's the in internal organ specific models. Uh, we are doing some research on this round. Uh, so these models are for chemicals that requires higher accuracy or dynamic of exposure. And uh, it is also suitable for chemicals with richer uh, physiological kinetic data. And this is an example of uh, just a research paper we're working on. So this is the uh, concentration of the lung after uh, in an occupational setting. So in occupational setting, you have exposure on and off during the day and also during the whole year. And this is an is uh, this is an this is a simulation over 14 years, and uh, with a five years uh, at the end of. And after exposure, we need toxicity to complete the picture of the human health. So chemicals can harm us in many different ways. Uh, they can have carcinogenicity, toxicity, they can have developmental toxicity, mutagenicity, genotoxicity, reproductive toxicity. They can also irritate and sensitize our skins. 
Some QSAR models, which are also in, employed in the click to can predict various endpoints qualitatively. That means it will give you a yes or no answer to a certain endpoint. Uh, but how can we assess toxicity quantitatively? As Paracelsus uh, famously say, all things are poison. Uh, it is only the dose that makes the, uh, the thing poison. And the dose is estimated from the exposure model uh, and the dose response relationship. So for the dose response relationship, uh, if you if any of the attendees are toxic uh, are toxicologists, you are more, very familiar with it with this one. But just for the sake of those who are not familiar, I I just go briefly about these uh, basic concepts. So we have a NOL, which is the which stands for no observed adverse effect level. Uh, we also have low L, uh, which stands for the lowest observed ad uh, adverse effect level, and uh, we also have the ED50, which is the effect uh, the effective dose for 50% of the population. So, so the show what is showing here is a typical dose response relationship. As the dose increase, you have more response, and usually this is in a negative way because we're talking about toxicity. And before a certain dose, your body can actually accommodate to this dose and combat it by itself. So you won't see any uh, adverse effect. And that, that is the uh, no, no at all. When you when no observed adverse, uh, adverse effect level are, are seen. And due to uh, the reality and practic practicality of the experiments, we cannot have a fully uh, continuous curve. So there will be gaps between the dose in the experiments. So for example, for, uh, for this sample curve, we have six doses. And at the third dose, we already see some adverse effect. And the second dose, we, we haven't seen any. So for the second one, it's called the no L. And the third one is the low L, which is in this experiment, the lowest uh, observed adverse effect level. And if we can cross from the 50% to the uh, dose response relationship and the point when they are crossed, the dose will be the ED50. And to estimate toxicity, we use the uh, effect factor, which is also commonly used in other LCRA methods. Uh, this is a metric to quantitatively describe the toxicity of chemicals to human health. Uh, the unit is uh, cases per kilogram intake. So this kilogram intake can be uh, seam seamlessly uh, uh, combined with the exposure model's output. And this effect factor is based on the assumption of a linear dose res response relationship, which may not be true, but uh, this is just how we, how we do it for now. And so the EF human, based on its definition of the dose response relationship, it will be 0.5, which represents 50%, divided by the ED50, the, uh, 50, uh, at the dose where 50% of the population is showing an effect. Uh, so estimating ED50 is key. To estimate this, we have three tiers of approach. The first, the tier one approach, will be using epidemiology studies. Uh, this will be the most ideal because this is human to human, but this is quite rare. We have a few dozen of these epidemiology studies to derive an, e, uh, an ED50, but we are faced with hundreds of millions of chemicals. And uh, for, for this one, they are directly using the slow factors observed in these studies. So this is the most ideal, but the rarest one. And then we can consult chronic animal studies, which is the tier two approach. Uh, for carcinogenic effects, we have a few hundred chemicals, close to 1,000. And this is estimated based on the experimental conditions stated in those experiments. Uh, it's basically the TD50, which is the, uh, uh, the tumor dose when the, we are seeing the animals are growing tumors. And, uh, cons uh, and then times the body weight uh, of the human because we want to make the translation from, uh, from animal to human. The lifetime, because these are chronic uh, experiments and we're assuming a lifetime uh, effect. Uh, and the uh, the end uh, days per day uh, the days per year, and then this is divided by two factors. Uh, one is the uh, correction factor for exposure duration, and uh, uh, for if it's a truly chronic, a chronic like a two year study, then this is basically one, so there's no correction. But if it's a sub chronic, we want to be conservative, so we divide by two. If it's for accurate, we divide by even further by five, uh, and the AF. A, which uh, is the correction factor for the animal extrapolation, and that will be shown in the next slide. And for the uh, inhalation part, is 
it's very similar, just changing the uh, measured endpoints and um, the measured dose <coughs> and the inhalation uh, rate. And this is a uh, this is basically the uh, interspecies extrapolation and the FA. So, for example, if the test animal was a mouse, then the FA will be 7.3, and therefore the equation here will be divided by 7.3. And uh, that was for carcinogenic effects. And for non-carcinogenic effects, we're basically using the NOL and low L uh, for the uh, uh, as the as the metric we're considering and multiplying with different factors uh, based on whether it's like for the NOL, it will be multiplied by nine, and for the low L, it will multiply by two point two five. Uh, this is based on the uh, the endpoints we're considering here. And finally, without the support of sufficient animal chronic uh, toxicity data, we still can rely on, although the uncertainty increases, on, uh, on acute animal studies. Uh, there are much more data available with LD50, which is the lethal dose to 50% of the population. And we can construct regression models to extrapolate from acute to chronic. And uh, based on the LD50s, we can still estimate some of the uh, long-term effects. But a word of caution, but a word of, ca word of caution uh, the uncertainty for this one will be quite high. So finally, to putting everything together, uh, toxicity itself of the chemical alone doesn't determine the risk. Uh, like nuclear waste can be sealed in lead barrels underground 200 meters. And for the time stay, like unless it leaks out, we can, uh, we, we can worry, uh, we can, we, we may not worry ourself, uh, ourselves about it. And our exposure to the chemical alone doesn't determine the risk yet neither, uh, like we drink and water every day. So the risk is actually the exposure times the toxicity. And then add in the consideration of the released amount, we can assess the impact. So the impact will be the release or emission times the risk. And this is how click do the exposure and human toxicity. And for the next one, we'll go to the predictive life cycle impact assessment presented by Ren Zheng So. Hi, uh, thanks, Ding Sheng. So this is Ren Zheng So. Uh, now I would like to introduce another module, the progress of, of another module in Click, which is a predictive life cycle impact assessment module, where we apply the machine learning techniques to predict the chemical life cycle impact based on, based on only a molecular structure. So again, this is a framework of the Click project. And this uh, predictive life cycle impact assessment module lies on the, at the very beginning of this project. And this module will only utilize the uh, chemical structure information to predict the uh, life cycle characterized result. Because it only requires very little input from our user, and so it can generate the result fairly fast. And this also gives us an advantage to screening large amounts of chemical in a uh, fairly short of time. So in the next uh, 15 minutes, I would like to go over the basic idea of this module and present you the current result we, uh, we got from this module so far. And also I would like to discuss the limitation and the future outlooks of, about this module. Hopefully after, this, uh, of, after my talk, uh, you will get a basic understanding about how do we use machine learning in life cycle assessment. So first of all, the reason why do we want to have this module are fairly simple because some of the module in Click requires a very specific input from the, from the two users. In some cases, those information are quite hard to get from our user, and in some time, they are confidential, so it's really hard to, uh, to sometimes it's really hard to uh, let our user to share this confidential information. So in this case, we must have an alternative pathway to estimate the final life cycle impact of our chemical without running through the, uh, the detail of, of other modules that requires specific input data from our user. And also we want to predict the final characterized result, which is the life cycle impact result. So uh, either, for example, glo 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 global warming potential or some endpoint characterized result, for example, human health. Uh, and also we need to generate this kind of result based on very simple input. So we would need a module to provide, this, uh, pro to provide us those kind of result with acceptable accuracy with simple inputs. So with that being said, probably the most simple, the, the simplest input we can get from users is the chemical structure information. So very obviously, chemical structure determines the physical properties and the environmental behavior of chemicals. For example, a chemical looks like this might have a 
might consume more a lot of energy when uh, doing the manufacturing phases because it has a it is much heavier than chemical like uh, looks like this and the chemical on the left have a lot of bonds have a lot of atoms so usually it requires a lot of energy to bonding everything together and also a chemical with a lot of halogen atoms might have higher global warming impact than a chemical on the right because halogen usually have a lot uh, have have a uh, a chemical has a lot of high, uh, more halogen atoms might have a higher uh, 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 infrared radioactive value than a chemical with less halogen atoms. So, but sometimes the relationship between chemical structure and the environmental impacts are not very obvious. The example I'm showing here are fairly straightforward and very, you know, very clear. So in this case, we need a strong model that uh, with, sufficient, uh, with sufficient complexity to use chemical structure to predict life cycle impact of chemical. Um, sorry, Diana, we have to mute you. So, so in convention, chemical structure can be presented by molecular uh, distributor. So usually you can break down the chemical into a vector that contains a lot of features, such as uh, molecular weight, number of our carbon and a lot of a lot of such things and uh, th that this gave us a very big advantage to build a regression model for example f uh, for example for physical properties a linear regression model has has shown a very sufficient uh, power to predict uh, 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 pr to predict a, a vapor pressure by using a molecular weight and this is a very straightforward uh, example using linear regression However, linear regression also has been proved the lack of sufficient complexity when mapping chemical structure to life cycle impact. So in this case, we need a non-linear regression model. And then another, uh, one very popular model this year in machine learning area is uh, artificial neural networks. So it is, has more, uh, it is more complicated than linear regression, but in most of the cases, it can give us a higher predictive power. So here I just want to give you a few examples of using artificial neural networks this year. One very obvious example is automatic car. It has been used by a lot of companies these days. And also another very popular example at early of this year is uh, Google uh, AlphaGo, which is, uh, has been using deep neural networks and also Monte Carlo tree and uh, to develop a, a, a robot to, to defeat a world champion of, uh, in the game of Go. And it's really show a very good power in terms of this kind of thing. And also, a uh, neural network has been also used in life cycle assessment area earlier. So Gregor Warner, who is one of the first author that using uh, uh, artificial neural networks that predict the, uh, some of the predict uh, some of the feature, some of the you know characteristic of chemical in life cycle assessment, and it has shown that a neural net neural network has the potential to be used in the in the area of life life cycle impact assessment. So with that being said, I just want to go over the, the workflow we, we have in this particular life set A module that we created this model. So first of all, we collected uh, 166 reported category results from the existing life cycle inventory database, which is we are using, uh, the database we are using right now is eco event database. And also we, for each of the chemicals that we collected from this database, uh, we also collected the uh, chemical identifier identifier from the chemical spider database, which is uh, so the identifier are uh, smiles, and uh, for each of the chemicals, the chemical descriptors is are calculated by a software called Dragon Six, and this software can give us a very a lot a lot uh, molecular descriptors, which is a uh, four thousand, and this value is much much higher than what we need. So we also applied some feature selection algorithm. To reduce the descriptor from 4,000 to 30, which fit to the, uh, which fits the need of our module, and uh, so so together, uh, molecular descriptors and uh, the collected life cycle impact result for each of the chemical. So those two values together combined our uh, created our training data, and using this training data, we also applied some uh, uh, some advanced techniques in machine learning areas such as cross validation and also. Uh, feature selection techniques to achieve the best artificial neural network structure and performance. And uh, the trained model is, a, uh, is available to predict uh, six, uh, six impact categories at this point. They are uh, cumulative energy demand and uh, acidification, global warming potential, and also three other endpoints 
impact categories such as human health, ecotoxicity, and uh, ecosystem quality. So here, I just want to show you two of the uh, two of uh, two examples about the model performance. Uh, performance. The first model I'm I'm showing here is the model uh, that predicting cumulative energy demand for a chemical. And the, on the left part of this graph, is talking about the uh, testing results. So those uh, those chemicals are are new to the model. And on the right side, those are all of the chemicals that we have collected, including the training chemicals. So on the x axis is the uh, reported. Uh, uh, livestock impact results that we collected from the current livestock inventory database, and the y-axis for both of the graph are the uh, are the uh, model prediction result. And as you can see here, and uh, also the blue line are the perfect prediction line. So if the point lies on the blue line, which means this uh, this, uh, 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 this model achieved 100% accuracy on this data on this data uh, on this chemical. So as you can see here, this model is doing fairly well for our cumulative energy demand. And the R score between the predicted value and the reported value is, are, is a 0.58 for the testing chemical. And again, those chemicals are new to the model. It's never, uh, this model has never seen this chemical before. So another model is the ecotoxicity module. And, the, and as you can see here, uh, the R score, uh, again, on the left side is the uh, testing chemical. And uh, on the right side is the, uh, all of the chemicals that we collected. And again, on, uh, for testing chemicals, our score is about 0.53, so still very good. And but as you can see here, here on the right, on the far right side of the of the graph, some of the chemical with extremely high uh, impact value are not uh, fairly captured by the model, which means that we are we need to collect more training data for those chemicals that we has very high uh, ecotoxicity value. And I just want to say, so for those chemicals, most of most of the chemicals on the uh, on the right side of the graph are pharmaceuticals. So it's the the impact value for pharmaceutical chemicals are really hard to capture. It's not only determined by the chemical structure. Sometimes, because in chemical factory, pharmaceutical requires a lot of uh, very high pur uh, purity requirement, and it might require a lot of steps between the can be it, uh, be the final product. So we also uh, working on, on that right now. So we need to collect uh, more chemical on, on that part. Also, we need to increase the molecular distributor um, for pharmaceutical at this point. So, so, uh, so that was the performance for some of the module we have so far. And, uh, but what's very important is that we don't want to just throw out some number to our users. We also want to indicate our users if the results are meaningful or not. So we also have to we help we also spend some effort to measure the applicable do, applicable domain for each of our models that we created. So the, the 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 idea behind it is that because the nature of the machine learning query chemicals that has very higher structure similarity between the training data are uh, with the training data are are likely to have higher prediction accuracy. So we could use this property to measure the prediction uh, prediction quality. By measuring the similarity between the new uh, new input chemical to our training data, so the method we are using here is uh, is measuring the Euclidean distance between the input chemical and the centroid and the centroid of the training data. The centroid is just the mean value of the of every uh, every feature in the molecular descriptor space. So the idea is very straightforward. Actually, if the distance is smaller between the input chemical and the centroid of the training data, the prediction would have a higher uh, confidence than some other chemical with, uh, that is very far away from the centroid of the training data. And to prove that, we selected a few testing chemicals and let our model to generate the prediction results for those testing chemicals. And also, we plot their distance between the centroid of the training data on the same graph. And this graph is showing that the distance, so the distance between the input chemical, which is a testing chemical, to the centroid of our training data, which is uh, which is in the in the in the red color, and the the, the blue line is the uh, prediction arrow for the same testing chemical. And as you can see here, they are sort of in the same pattern, although it's not perfect. But very obviously, uh, for some chemicals with smaller distance to the centroid, the prediction arrow, especially at this area, is much lower than chemical with higher distance. So we also conduct some analysis on those chemicals. And this this table is talking about for each of the mod, uh, for each of the six models that we have right now, and we also uh, we measured the applicable domain for each of the model, 
And as you can see here, the green color is, is talking about the chemical that lies inside of the applicable model applicable domain. And this is, a, this is an arrow of the prediction uh, for each of the model. And as you can see here, the arrow for chemicals that are inside of the domain is much slower than the chemicals that, are, uh, that lies, outside of, uh, lies outside of the applicable domain. So this is showing that we can use Euclidean distance as a, as a proxy to measure if this chemical is lies in the applicable domain or not, so that we can notify our user if their input chemical, uh, if our model will predict a fairly higher accuracy to the input chemicals that they provided to our model or not. So with that, that's some, uh, just some conclusion and future outlook about this module. And we developed a module uh, that can screen chemical life cycle impact using very simple input from a user, which is molecular descriptor. And we are, at this point, we provide three midpoint impact category and also three endpoint impact categories to our user. And we also measure the applicable domain, which can tell our user if the input chemical are good or not, or a, a fit to our model or not. And in the future, we need to increase the number of predict uh, predictable impact category uh, beyond those, uh, those six categories that are available at this point. And also, we need to collect more chemical life cycle impact data, uh, in, uh, life cycle inventory data, so that we can increase the size of our training data, which can definitely pr improve the accuracy of our model. So with that, so that's the, uh, the current progress of the life cycle impact assessment module. So I would, now I would like to turn the podium to my colleague Yu Weixin. She is going to talk about the uncertainty module in the clip. Thank you, Ray. And now I will talk about uncertainty module in the click tool. As you've seen from our colleagues' presentations, the, the click tool is integrated by many modules from life cycle inventory to impact assessment. And all of the modules have uncertainties. These uncertainties could come from using inaccurate or unrepresentative data, or due to some choices we made in the system boundary. To consider all the uncertainties and the possible outcomes in our tool for making a sound decision, we need to make we need to look at uncertainties and the possible outcomes in our tool. Uh, so we need to study the uncertainty and quantify those uncertainty. For different modules, we need to treat those uncertainty differently. And before I go through an example of how we perform uncertainty analysis in CLIC and how the results look like, I will first explain how to treat uncertainty in general. The common and the simplified approach for identifying and quantifying uncertainty um, includes certain steps. First uh, is to collect data, which normally from literature and often resulting in single point estimates. Second, estimate a distribution or certainty range for individual data. Usually we could use expert guesses, uh, such as plus minus 10% or use the pedigree matrix. And then we can apply Monte Carlo simulations or other similar tools to simulate those variation ranges and model the uncertainty. An alternative approach is called analytical solution, but it requires more complex mathematical relationship. This diagram shows the workflow of Monte Carlo simulation. Each input of calculating the results is considered as a stochastic parameter. And each time, random value of each input is selected based on its specified distribution. The result will be calculated accordingly. After a large number of simulations, for example, 1,000 times or even more, the probability distribution of the results and other statistical information are obtained to describe the output uncertainty. So let's assume uh, we have a conceptual model now, which is shown in this graph. Um, the model has several inputs from X1 to Xn, and the inputs are processed through the model to calculate the results Y. To quantify the uncertainty of the output Y, we need to propagate the uncertainty uh, from input X1 to Xn. 
Then we apply the Monte Carlo simulations to find what the output is distributed. We first estimate the distributions for input parameters and then run the model for a large number of times. And after that, we can get a probability distribution for our model output. Sometimes a small change in a parameter can induce a large change in output. In addition to the uncertainty analysis, we also perform global sensitivity analysis to understand the model structure and the input-output relationships. This analysis can also help identify major contributors to output uncertainty in the uncertain input space. In CLIC, we use a global approach, which means we vary all inputs simultaneously, considering their full distributions. For those of you who have trouble distinguishing, uh, distinguishing sensitivity analysis and uncertainty analysis, the difference between um, a sensitivity analysis and uncertainty analysis is that uncertainty analysis is performed in order to describe the range of possible outcomes giving a set of inputs, while sensitivity analysis is performed in order to describe how sensitive the outcome variables are to variation of input uh, parameters. Since there, are may, there may be multiple input parameters, sensitivity analysis can help you determine which ones drive the majority of the variation of the outputs. In CLIC, we can run the global sensitivity analysis jointly with uncertainty analysis. As I mentioned, we run Monte Carlo simulations for the uncertainty analysis, which needs to find the distribution of each input and generate a large number of Monte Carlo samples for the results. To the uncertainty analysis, we use the same Monte Carlo samples that are generated and stored from the uncertainty calculation. Compared to traditional sensitivity analysis, uh, the joint Monte Carlo-based global sensitivity analysis saves a lot of time from doing additional sampling. So now we have some ideas how we treat uncertainty. Let's look at a specific module in CLIC, which is called Fade and Transport module. If you watch the Fade and Transport module's presentation from the second webinar, you may be familiar to this graph. The Fade and the Transport module can calculate the daily concentrations of chemical for 10 years after the chemical has been released to the environment. 26 environmental compartments are considered in our module. For example, uh, fresh water, air, and serving soil compartments. The inputs of the fade and transport module include meteorological data, such as precipitation and temperature, water and soil data, such as pH and soil type. Uh, we also uh, consider chemical property data, uh, which are from QSA models. And there are 101 inputs in total. We use benzene the xylon as an example chemical, and the fade transport will give us a single value for the average concentration in fresh water compartment, uh, which is 1.2 e to the negative 9 kilogram per cubic meter. The running time for one chemical in one location for all environmental compartments in the fade and transfer model is around three seconds. By doing 10,000 samples of Monte Carlo simulations, the total running time is about eight hours. After we run the uncertainty analysis, it gives us 10,000 results of this value. And here's the histogram from the simulations for the fresh water concentration of this chemical and we see the concentration mostly for in the range from 5 uh, e to the minus 10 to 2 e to the minus 9 kilogram per cubic meter. Our tool provides not only the histogram of the results, but also a, a summary table for users to better understand the uncertainty of the results. We include uh, the deterministic value, probabilistic average from the simulated results, probabilistic medium, coefficient of variance, and also k-values to describe uncertainties. 
The heat map is another option to communicate uncertainty, which is also included in the tool. In this graph, the darker the color, the higher coefficient of variance, which means higher uncertainty is. For this chemical, we see the fresh water concentration has higher uncertainty than air, but lower uncertainty than seawater uh, sediment. From doing the global sensitivity analysis, we have the result shows that the, ran the ranking of each parameter's contribution to the output uncertainty. The top five contributors to the concentration of this chemical in fresh water compartments are degradation rate in water, air water partition coefficient, depth fresh water, natural soil area, and degradation rate in air. What is interesting is that we found the top five important parameters accounts for 95% of the total contribution to the uncertainty. This means in the uh, if we improve the accuracy of these five parameters, the results can significantly be increased from its reliability. To conclude the uncertainty module, we want to emphasize that uncertainty analysis relies on the input-output relationship and can generate the output distribution. The sensitivity analysis can let us know uh, major contributors to the output uncertainty. We also want to mention that in our tool, the default uncertainty values can be updated by the user if better information is available. And, and Jess will talk about more about the application of our tool. Thanks, Eli. Um, and here's just a general overview again of the schematic of the entire click tool. And what I want to talk about a little bit today is how we're trying to test um, how this tool can be used in practice and how maybe some of the people on the call might want to also get more involved. Um, so here are, is a list of our current industry partners um, and this list is growing and I want to thank those that have already participated and those who might be participating in the future. Um, and the ways that we engage with our external stakeholders, which are from um, not just industry, but also from government, working with groups both at the EPA and the California Department of Toxic Substance Control, is that throughout the development of the CLIC tool, starting at the module development level, and then through doing some case studies, which I'll talk about in more detail today, um, ultimately to help guide how we design our user interface for the tool, which we'll be doing over the next few months, and then ultimately um, when we're pilot testing the full tool next year. Um, and having input from our partners at these various stages is really important for this tool to actually be valuable in practice. Um, we're able to incorporate the needs and the problems that need to be addressed for the users at, er at an early stage, which gives us still enough flexibility to change the design or to do deep dives into research areas that we may not have initially thought were important. Um, it also helps us to validate some of our tools. So in some instances, we've asked our industry partners to let us test something they already know something about to see if our results um, align with what their expectations would be. Um, we also can work with them to understand how they're currently doing this kind of analysis to compare how Click um, could be used compared to the other resources and tools that they have available to them. And then lastly, to develop some credibility, we want to make sure that at least the initial users really understand the ins and outs of what's going on in the back end of the tool. Um, this webinar is one step in doing that, um, along with some more in-depth conversations that we'll have with specific partners. Um, and the idea behind this is we want you to understand and really believe in our methods the way that we do so that you're able to trust the results and understand um, the ins and outs of it. So right now we're still at the stage where we're running case studies. Um, and just to give you an idea of what a case study actually is, is it's a way for us to test all of the modules of the click tool with the inputs from an industry partner uh, so that we are applying it to a realistic situation in which it would be used in practice. Um, because the 
tool is broken up into all of these modules, it doesn't, we don't have to run the full tool in order to do a case study. We can handpick which modules are most um, appropriate and best to test with a given industry partner um, or can include in our earlier stages just the ones that we felt were ready to actually be tested versus those that were still in the earlier stages of development. And we can apply this to one chemical, a group of chemicals, an entire product. Um, and we make sure because we know that the IPs, the IP of our industry partners is very important. Um, we put a lot of NDAs in place and we make sure that this information sees the minimum number of eyes um, in order to run the analysis. Um, the goal of these case studies, as I spoke to a little bit earlier, is to validate all of our models, make sure they're producing results that meet our expectations and that are um, valuable and understandable to the user who would be using it. Um, to look at the feasibility of using this tool and what the limitations are. Um, some things we've discovered is that we really need to figure out a way to address polymers and there's work going on right now to do that because of the variation in their molecular weight. Um, and also to understand user preferences, what kind of units they're familiar with in their inputs and outputs, what kind of information is easy for them to input versus would take a laborious exercise to gather internally within their company. Um, so to look at some of those more practical issues. Um, and when we do run a case study, the goal of the case study is defined when we're setting up the scope with that partner. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in how we can run these and they can be really dependent on, you know, which specific modules or which specific kind of comparisons the industry partner uh, wants to try to make. So just to give you an example, um, we recently have been working on and on, are on our kind of third iteration of a case study with Sherwin-Williams. Um, I'm not going to show you any real results from this case study because, you know, we do want to protect the IP of that company. Um, and, you know, this is not a externally published report. Um, but just to give you an idea of kind of what the framework and outline look like, uh, we were looking at an interior paint and we were at this point not using the release model. So we were um, using two release assumptions. One, that some of the release was going to wastewater treatment after washing of the paintbrushes. And a majority of it was going to indoor air after application and then subsequently being released to outdoor air. Um, so for this case study, I've highlighted here which modules we actually incorporated. Um, so just to give you a sense of you know, how broad or narrow the scope of the case study could be. Um, this is, and don't worry about reading too much into this, I know there's a lot on this screen, um, but this outlines just from our internal back-end understanding how the data flows between the modules. And having this kind of outline when we've been running our case studies has really helped us to understand the architecture of our tool as we are putting it into a web-based online forum and in order to communicate to the developers who will be helping us to actually construct this. So even though for these case studies we've been running it individually within the modules and manually transferring the inputs and outputs, having to run them all at one time for a set of chemicals has helped us to uh, understand the architecture and how we can actually get everything pieced together um, for the final product. For the, oh sorry, one last thing, above this dotted line are the upstream impacts that we've, we were able to estimate in this case study, so from the chemical production side, and then below the dotted line are the downstream impacts, so everything from you know, the release of the product during the use phase on in the life cycle. Um, for the upstream impacts, I'm just gonna really quickly go through some examples of what the outputs of this case study looked like. Um, we used the predictive LCIA module that Ray just, or Ren Shang just described to you um, to look at these six impact categories. Um, and we also use these case studies to play around with what some of the visuals, re visual representations of these results could look like. So I'll show us a few of those today. Um, this is some of the results for a contribution analysis for each chemical um, in the product that we looked at across all six impact categories. Um, we also can break these down and look at for each 
in a more, in order to look at, you know, each impact category, specifically what the breakdown is per chemical. Um, we can slice and dice this data, you know, a lot of different ways, and we gave them a lot of different examples in the report, but I'm just showing a couple uh, with you today. For the downstream impacts, you know, we had to, this is a simplified version of the figure I showed earlier, but just shows kind of the flow of inputs and outputs between the different model, the modules. Um, we have talked about the human exposure assessment today, um, but some of these others have been discussed in previous webinars. Um, a couple examples from the fate and transport results, which might look familiar if you watched the last webinar, but we can use a heat map to show the concentrations in different compartments. Um, these are what we're calling the bulk compartments, and we can get even more specific and break this down into the sub compartments as well. This is one visual that we're currently looking at, including in the actual tools outputs. Um, but, you know, part of using these case studies is to ask, the user or industry partners if they think that this is a valuable way to display the results um, and we appreciate any input on that um, or suggestions. One thing that uh, if you're familiar with the fate and transport model you already understand is that this is a dynamic model and so we can actually show you know at the daily level of granularity how high or low the concentration would be so we can look at things like days of exceedance of a certain threshold. And so this is just a way to show how variable um, those results can be in a, in a certain environmental compartment. Um, as UA just showed you, we also are able to estimate the uncertainty. Um, we're going to be doing this for all of the modules, but for the Sherwin-Williams case study, we did looked at this specifically for the fan transport and also used a heat map to um, align with the same kind of visual representation so that it would be easier to understand where it was applied. Um, and we also were able to look at ecotoxicity by comparing the environmental concentration in a certain compartment to um, an LC50 at, at value and uh, an OEC value for uh, freshwater species to see if there were any exceedances given the amount of product being released into the freshwater compartment and that ultimately ended up there after modeling the fate and transport in the environment. Um, lastly, we used the exposure model um, to compare the concentrations of exposure for all of these chemicals uh, from all of the different pathways, inhalation, um, and this is all of the outdoor environmental compartments, so excluding indoor air inhalation, so outdoor air inhalation and ingestion um, throughout a variety of different pathways, and then compared this to um, the EPA's cancer threshold. And at the end of these case studies, we'll provide a detailed report to the industry partner, um, which prompts a discussion that we usually start off with a conference call uh, with any of the stakeholders on their end and our entire team to discuss the detailed results and to present uh, our findings and how this has helped us update the tool. Um, these conversations typically start at an hour, but you know, have a lot of follow-up and as we make updates to our methods and to the tool, we also continue to provide updated results. Um, and typically in these conversations, we're also pointed in some directions, um, whether that be data or whether that be different units to investigate um, that lead us to improvements in how we're generating these results. So here are just some of the learnings that we've had so far from running case studies, um, not just the Sherwin-Williams, but also in others. Um, we have determined that for the QSAR inputs, which you would have heard about in an earlier webinar, we needed a prioritization method in order to determine which ones to use first, because there are a lot of different models, platforms, and we, we really needed kind of a decision hierarchy to decide when available which data to use and we needed that to be transparent and will be included in a report. Um, we understood that while our users appreciate 
the you know simplicity of results um, when they're using things regularly that we really need to have clear supplemental reports in the back end of the tool, including you know every single data source that we would have used um, in order for them to have more confidence because we will at times have very technical audiences using this tool. Um, we have since running this case study um, with Sherwin Williams improved our indoor air exposure model, which Ding Xing spoke to a bit um, in this presentation. And we've had several discussions with our industry partners about the right way to provide context um, by understanding how they're currently evaluating toxicity or life cycle impacts in their companies so we can make sure we're tailoring our tools so it's not something that needs to be interpreted separately and then have them try to compare it to how they're, tip they're already modeling these things. We wanna make sure we understand kind of the status quo and so we can fit ours in and provide the results in context of how they're already doing these things. There are a variety of different ways to set up these case studies. Here are just a couple of examples um, that are of interest to us, um, but we are very open to any kind of ideas that any of our partners have about how this might be useful and to see through a case study uh, how we can further investigate the applications of the tool. And if you want to participate in a case study, if you haven't already, um, we would love to hear from you. Um, here is my email address um, if you want to contact me directly. We, and I typically um, am, am the PhD student who is the contact point to run our case studies. Um, and we also, this is our click email list and uh, that's a good place to go if you have any general inquiries about the case studies or about the click tool as a whole. Um, and Lastly, we just want to thank you for your attention and participating in this webinar. If this is the first one that you've seen, there are two others that we've done over the last several weeks, and those are already online. This one will be online um, very, very soon, within the next day or so. Um, and with that, um, we have a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions now, but of course, email is also a great way um, if there are more in-depth questions too. Yeah, you're welcome to unmute yourself if you have questions to ask us right now. Or you can type in the chat box. Uh, if there's no questions, we will conclude this webinar and thank you again for your. Oh, wait, oh. There's a... yeah, I think we're just having a chat. So uh, we have a question of how are you looking at validating the output? Uh, so actually, we have a lot of outputs for so for each module, the output will be different and the validation of those output will be different. Like for Rinsheng's predictive LCRA. Uh, validation, he's doing the uh, machine learning stuff, so he has a training data set and a test data set. So the test data set is the validation of the output. And for the uh, concentration, uh, like for the fit and transfer module, uh, uh, the validation will be like comparing that with other modules at first, and also if we have data available, we will compare them with a real, real measure, real world concentrations. So we have different ways of validating the outputs of the click module. Uh, we have another question is why predictive LCIA module only used for upstream? Uh, Rinsheng, you may want to take this. Right. <clears throat> so it's uh, actually this is not only used for upstream because the output of the predictive LCIA modules is going directly to the final uh, life cycle impact result, which is sort of passing all of the other module in click. So, so it's directly connecting to the input from a user and uh, it's also the output of the module is also directly going to the user as well. So, uh, so, it's, so, the, so it, it is located at the very beginning of the entire click tool, but it's also connecting to the very end of the click tool. So I, I don't, I'm not sure if this answered your question or not.
Any other questions? Uh, if there's no further question, uh, we will conclude the webinar. Thank you again. And uh, if any of you are going are, are coming over to our annual review meeting, uh, please don't forget to register through the uh, website. And uh, we hope to we look forward to seeing you next Friday, whether in person or online. Yeah. All right. Thank you, and uh, have a nice day. No, I'm not muted. Do you want me to